But it's not, it shouldn't, um, we should be able to see these are the same by using that superimposing idea we saw last term. We can rotate one of these molecules so it looks like the other. But that shouldn't really even be necessary. As soon as we see this molecule is meso, we know it doesn't have an enantiomer, so we don't even bother trying to draw that other one. So that's what I would really encourage you to do. Draw one of the products and then check whether it's meso. If it is meso, then you don't need to worry about drawing the enantiomer because it doesn't have one. And if it's not meso, then you can go ahead and draw the enantiomer by just making a single swap at each stereocenter. All right, so this is one of the tricks in the stereochemistry that we have to watch out for. Check whether your first product is meso. So here, there's really only one product. You could draw either of these, but you wouldn't want to end up with both. That was the only thing that you guys didn't notice here, but you, all, you guys were already on top of the idea of retention of configuration, that these should both end up pointing in the same place because they started in the same place. So now, let's draw the mechanism in all the products. I had a hard time drawing this for some reason, but let's draw the mechanism in all the products. How many products here? One. What do you think? Two. How can we tell? The best trick is, is this meso? No. No. Would you agree with that? Would you agree that this is not meso? Yeah. That means that it must have an enantiomer. That's the easiest way to proceed here. Since this is not meso, it must have an enantiomer. Um, how do we know this is not meso? Because there's no plane of symmetry. There's no plane of symmetry, so it must have an enantiomer. Now, the other approach is to actually um, make a single swap at both stereocenters and then try to ask yourself whether you can flip or rotate this picture to lay it on top of this. To me, that's the inferior method because people tend to make mistakes about that. A lot of people think that you can rotate this molecule so it will look like this. That's not going to work. For example, if we took this molecule and flipped it like this, this substituent on a wedge would turn into a dash, and it still wouldn't look like this substituent over here. If we tried to do a flip like this, this substituent would, st would go into a dash, which would not look like this. So with cis dienophiles, you generally get one product, and with trans, you get two? Let's see, I guess that would be a bit of an overgeneralization. Things get more complicated that there's also substituents over here. 
So we, instead of learning, uh, memorizing the rule of thumb, we really have to be able to figure it out separately in each case. Now, so what's the way to figure it out? The best approach is, this is something I didn't emphasize enough when we were working together last term. In fact, I, get, I think I gave you guys a bad method last term. The method I gave you last term was draw both possible products and then check whether you can rotate one to lay it on the other. Um, but, but people are not very good at rotating molecules in their mind. What I should have said is draw one of the products and check whether it's meso. If it is meso, you know you don't need to bother with the, with the enantiomer because there isn't one. And if it's not meso, you know that it does have an enantiomer that's different from it. That, that's really the method I should have taught you last term that would have made things simpler. I, I didn't understand the best way to teach stereochemistry when we went through this together. So this is our better method for drawing all the products. Draw one product and just check whether it's meso. Because it's not that hard to check whether something's meso. That's a lot easier than rotating one molecule in your head to see if it flips on another one. Especially when we get to some really complicated Diels alders that we'll be getting to that are really hard to flip and rotate. This is not meso, so it must have an enantiomer. So these really are two separate products. This is one of the main ways that Diels alder is tested. So these really are two separate products over here. And notice how you can save time by using condensed notation here. You don't have to draw out these whole substituents each time. Now, both of you correctly saw that because of retention of configuration, since these started pointing in different directions, they should end up pointing in different directions. So you both got that right. They were trans here, so they should be trans here. So that's good that you saw that. Yeah, I believe that's so. In fact, I should mention also, I'm noticing in the book, I didn't remember this, but in the book they usually have a lot of heat and a long period of time. Some of these reactions are like up to 20 hours or something. I don't know if you would be required to put that on the test, but in the book they're usually mentioning not just heat, but also long periods of time. I'm not going to put the time on the board, but there is you mention that all the time. Um, and Is this from your notes, or? No, this is what I just did. Okay. Okay, yeah, let's talk about that. As usual, uh, it helps me to put in the asterisks and the dots. Now, on the dotted carbons, these are not going to be stereocenters, because there's two cyanide groups each. So we don't need to bother drawing wedges and dashes for the cyanides. By the way, what's the new issue that this problem is introducing? What did we just finish talking about? We just finished talking about the relationship between two substituents on the dienophile. In the earlier examples, we were seeing two substituents on the dienophile. And we saw that if the two substituents start out cis on the dienophile, they end up cis on the ring. And if the two substituents start out trans on the dienophile, they end up trans on the ring because of retention of configuration. How is this different? Well, now we're focusing on the relationship between two substituents on the diene. Now we're looking at the relationship between substituents on the diene. Now let's suppose that I put this substituent on a wedge. Where should I put this substituent? On a wedge. And why is that? Because it's 
because they're both pointing to the same point, I guess. Okay, that's good. Now you're right. In a sense, these are both pointing in similar directions. They should end up similar. But we need some terminology to explain why these are similar over here. We can't really call this cis and trans because these are on separate double bonds. You can't be cis and trans if you're on separate double bonds. We need a whole new terminology, which I actually think you were remembering. You're remembering the inside-outside terminology. So that's the terminology we need here. So here's our model. Outside, inside. Outside, inside. This is brand new terminology that we've never used before because we've never really talked about stereochemistry around the diamine. So I, I think it, it, hopefully it's clear why these two substituents are called the outside substituents. O for outside. These two substituents are called the outside substituents, and these two are called the inside substituents. 